Welcome everybody. I think everybody is ready to go. Sorry, we were a little bit late. We had a, a little bit technical glitches, but it's such a pleasure to have you here for the second session in the Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture's digital series, New Opportunities in Retail for Seafood Products. I'm Lynn Godlin, CEO of Perennia, and I'm delighted to be your guide through today's session. For those of you who may not know um, Perennia at all, um, we do work with agriculture, seafood, cannabis, and food and beverage processors to help them reach their business goals. And we, and we do that through technical services like production advice, applied research, food safety, and product development. Um, so let's get started. Um, before, we, before we move on to our exciting speakers, I do want to uh, go through some Zoom housekeeping um, uh, rules with folks. So all participants will have their audio and video turned off during the webinar. If you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. If preferred, you can also uh, you ask a question in the chat function of the webinar. Um, the chat and Q&A will be monitored throughout the session, but we'll address the questions and answers at the end of the presentation. So please don't be shy, ask some questions as we go along and we'll make sure we get to them. So I do want to talk a little bit about um, our sponsors before we get to our speakers. So um, our, uh, our overall series sponsors are Farm Credit Canada and the Nova Scotia Fisheries and Aquaculture Loan Boards. Um, both of these lenders are terrific options for fisheries and aquaculture companies. And I really encourage you to visit their websites if you have a chance to see what they have to offer. And our session sponsors today are Alliance Rubber Company and Cook Aquaculture. So let's just take a moment to learn a little bit more um, about them. you guys, but I think I heard a little John Mellencamp, Jack and Diane in there. Let's go to Cook's. to our series and session sponsors, your support is truly, truly appreciated. Before we get to the speakers, I do wanna, um, because I don't want people to be dropping off at the end of the session and not know that we've got other sessions coming up. So the next session, I'll mention it again at the end, is um, next week, I believe, maybe a week after, um, advances in shore-based seafood industry technology and addressing the challenges to modernization. So, Let's get on to the session. So these are our session's panelists for today, Al Archibald, Devin Zanada, Doug Park, and Patrick Kelly. And we're gonna start with Al Archibald. So let me just give me a little minute to introduce Al and then we'll be on our way. So Al has ha held several executive leadership positions in various, various facets of the food industry. 
Currently, he leads Archibald Analytics, Inc., a consulting practice established to help small and medium-sized companies fill the gap that often exists when a company has a technically sound product but lacks the capacity or experience to commercially execute a viable go-to-market strategy. Most of his career has been focused on the particular sales and marketing challenges faced by the seafood industry, including stints in salmon aquaculture in British Columbia, the wild fishery in Nova Scotia with Clearwater, as well as value added seafood production in Nova Scotia with St. Mary's River Smokehouses until its sale in 2017. So everybody, please join me in welcoming Al Archibald to our screen. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, hope uh, everybody can hear me and I'm uh, really excited to uh, be involved in this panel today. I think we have a very interesting panel. And so my job today is essentially to set the, set the table as I call it. Um, and so what I'd like to do if the, the, is review sort of the premise or the theme of the session is that there's been a big accelerated shift in seafood sales, particularly in 2020 as a result of COVID. And, and, the, and that premise goes on to say that if you're well positioned, in the seafood supply chain, you should be able to take advantage of that. So what I'd like to do is sort of examine those assumptions. And, and first of all, I wanna do, what I wanna do is I wanna go over and talk about what's actually been the shift in, in uh, food purchases from grocery and retail versus food service. Now, how much has it been? What's the difference between US and Canada? Are there differences? And, um, and, and, and what about new channels? Have some new channels opened up for uh, that seafood producers and processors could take advantage of? So, and I wanna look at that assumption. I wanna talk about the supply chain and I'll, and I'll, and I'll review it as I see it uh, for Nova Scotia seafood. And then uh, the last part of my presentation, I really wanna talk about some of the trends that are occurring in the marketplace some of the ones that we think might endure going into 2021 and beyond. And then in particular, I wanna look at the challenges and constraints and opportunities that Nova Scotia and Atlantic Canadian seafood companies might, uh, might face as we go forward. So let's talk and look a little bit at what's, what's been the shift in um, the purchases of food from grocery stores versus restaurants. So first of all, what I'd like to do is talk about the United States. So here's a graph, which is actually goes back to 1960, which shows the portion of total food purchased away from home, i.e. in a restaurant or, or, or spending on food that's consumed in the home. And so what you can see here is essentially in the United States um, up to 214. And if you extend this even on to just prior to 2020, it's roughly 50-50. So that's a pretty significant uh, uh, amount of uh, spending uh, at, at, at uh, grocery stores and, and, and restaurants, it's basically split half and half. So the question is what happened in 2020? Here's a chart and the line to focus on here is the red line. So here's a, here's a line by month which shows the food at home share, the stuff that's consumed at home, what's happened to it. So you can see that it went from, there's its 50% in 2020, the red line, it's gone up to well over 65%, but that peaked early on, that peaked in April. And then it's been, I'm assuming as the economy opened up in the United States and, and, and restaurants um, were open again, that people started to resume um, their, their, their uh, pre-COVID habits. So the big question to ask is, okay, where's the, how's that line gonna go? Is it gonna continue to fall down? Are we gonna go back to 50-50? And, um, or you know, are we, have we reached a new normal? And I think that's the question that everybody's asking. I think, I think it's pretty clear that we're not gonna go back exactly to where we were, but where are we gonna end up? I mean, people are still gonna wanna go out but on the other hand, maybe people have developed new skills in preparing food in the kitchen. They certainly saved a lot of money. Uh, so the jury's still out on that. 
but I think it's kind of interesting. Um, this is the situation in the States. And so now what I'd like to do uh, before we talk about Canada is I want to do a little poll. So it's the first time I've tried this. I think it's the first time it's been done in the series. So bear with me. Um, but I'm going to start a poll. And here's how this works. You're going to see I'm launching the poll now. You can all see the question in front of you. That's wrong. That's, I'm going to end that poll. Sorry, that's the, that's the poll I wanted to launch. So let me try this one. Okay, so what I'd like you to try to do, and I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds, is I want you to answer this question. What percentage of the food in Canada is, is purchased from restaurants prior to COVID? What do you think it was? You saw the, the number for the States, it was about 50-50. So what do we think it is in Canada? And I'm watching the results come in. You can't see them yet. I'm gonna end it shortly when I get the answer that I'm hoping for. No, I'm just kidding. Wow, very interesting. Um, right now, roughly 40% of people think it's more than 50 and 40% think it's less than 50. So I'm gonna end the poll and I'm gonna share the results. So really interesting. So, so a little less than half think it's less than 50 and, and um, um, a little less than that think it's more than 50. So, um, and about 20% think it's the same as the States. So what's the, what's the number? I'm gonna go back to my uh, presentation. Okay, here you go. Here's the number for Canada. It's 30%. So I think, I think the majority, let's say close to the majority, believe that it was less than 50. So that's very interesting. But I, I don't think many people guess it is as low as it is. So, so it's 30% of, of food purchased in Canada is from restaurants. And it, and it started actually to drop in 2019, slightly less than 30, but it hasn't shown a lot of growth. And then what happened in, 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 20, in 2020, this is an estimate, but most people feel that the that grocery store spending um, represented about 85%. So, so now the question to ask is why has it, what's gonna happen going forward? And, and uh, I think there'll be some recovery, but we've got a long way to go before we're anywhere close to what the US is purchasing from restaurants. And, and I actually tried to look into that and I tried to answer the question, why do we think there's less food purchased from restaurants than there is from, uh, in, in Canada than there is in the United States? And I looked at a couple of indicators. One is I thought, well, maybe we're more rural than the Americans. Well, we're not. We're both, we have the same percentage of our population living in, in, in urban centers as the US. But then they said, well, okay, maybe there's fewer restaurants per capita in Canada versus the US. And in fact, it's the same, the same stat. So if anybody can think of the answer, please fire it in <laughs> on the Q&A section because I don't have a ready answer for why we're so much less uh, dependent on restaurants for our food. So anyway, that's what's happened in Canada with regards to spending on restaurant food. So now let's talk about seafood purchasing. And um, specifically zeroing in here. So here's something interesting. So this is, if this is from headlines from early um, uh, 2021. And as you can see, these are sort of seafood press articles about the surge in seafood sales, double digit growth, US retailers notching uh, um, uh, record sales in seafood. So just before I go on to talk about what's happened, I'm gonna try another poll. Let's see if we can do another one here. And um, this poll question is the following. I'm gonna launch it and I'll talk about it. So now I'd like you to take a few minutes or actually less than that, how about 30 seconds? And very quickly off the top of your head, um, 
see if you can guess at what percentage of a typical Canadian grocery store, their total store sales comes from seafood. What percentage of, the, of when you walk into your Loblaw, what percentage of the, the dollars going through that store or a Sobeys or a Costco or a Walmart, what percentage of those stores sales are seafood? And that's seafood, not just fresh, not just frozen, but canned and shelf stable products. So I'm gonna give you about another 10 or 15 seconds. And I'm starting to see the answer that I was hoping for. So I'm gonna end the poll very shortly. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna end the poll and I'm gonna share the results. There's hopefully, there's probably a lot of people that are selling seafood in the, <laughs> sharing on this webinar with us today because there's the results. So essentially 56% of people, so let's say a majority um, essentially got the right answer. It's less than 5% uh, in the stores. And um, a few people thought it was five to 15 and a very few thought it was more than 15. So there are the results, 56, less than five, 40%, five to 15 and five, four. So, so now let's talk a little bit about what are the specifics related to that? Um, that spending. So just to set it up properly, roughly with seafood, I'm just talking seafood, no, not any other food, roughly two thirds of the seafood consumed in North America is at food service traditionally before COVID and about a third at retail, just seafood I'm talking about. So when you saw those headlines on the previous slide about frozen seafood up 35%, or you didn't know the numbers, but you knew they were double digits. So look at this, frozen seafood sales up 35% year over year in, in 2020. Fresh seafood up 25 and shelf stable up even uh, a little bit less, but still up 20%. So that was all the, the, the uh, acclaim in the, uh, in, in the uh, seafood press. It's great numbers, fantastic. The only thing that I wanna kind of highlight is the fact that it's, it still represents 5% of total store sales. So if it's up 35%, it's gone from five to what, six and, six and a half. So it's still a relatively share, a small share of total uh, food shares. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. The other thing I think that's really interesting here and, and, and Devin at, at uh, Cook True North is gonna talk more details about specifically what's gone on within, within species, but well, I will say this, that frozen has been going up uh, since around 2017. There's been a real reversal in frozen food generally across the board. It sort of really became pronounced in frozen vegetables. And you saw a lot of different categories of, of formats. You saw a lot better packaging of, of frozen vegetables. And you can buy cauliflower rice and a whole variety of different things. So frozen has reversed. And I think it's been embraced by all consumers now that they think frozen is a good thing. And um, so that similarly has been reflected in seafood. So I think that's a really significant thing to keep in mind. And um, uh, the other thing is, and I'll, I'll leave it to Devin to, to explain it, is that, and I know Doug Park was surprised at that, <laughs> was that, that, that actually shrimp was surpassed by crab last year in the United States. So that's another really interesting question. Why did that happen? There's some good theories out there on why, but I'll leave that for later to talk about. So that's what's going on with regards to uh, seafood spending at retail on seafood. Now, what I'd like to do is go through the supply chain. So again, the theme of, the, the theme of this session is, well, there's been this big shift towards retail, you know, if you're positioned well as, a, as an industry, you should be able to take advantage of it. Have there been some new channels that have opened up? So let's talk about that. And, and I'd like to kind of review the various links in the supply chain. So here's the traditional supply chain. I call this once upon a time. This is what people often think about when they think about how does product move to market? You know, you've got a producer, you've got a distributor, someone's got to move it to my, to my, uh, to my uh, final outlet, and that's either a grocery store or a restaurant, and there I am, Mr. and Mrs. Consumer over here, ready to buy that product. Pretty simple looking, pretty simple looking uh, system. 
Here's my take on what the modern seafood supply chain looks like. And I'm not gonna go into every one of these boxes, but what I am gonna do is I'm gonna walk through the various components here. So essentially starts over on the left-hand side with production and then all moves all the way over to the right-hand side to final consumption. So as you can see, it's a bit busier than that, than that uh, previous, doc, uh, previous uh, uh, diagram. And I wanna talk a little bit about what have been the significant changes in each of these links. So let's start with the primary side. So everything in red really is sort of the, the production of seafood and moving through first receiver, uh, getting ready to go into the market. So, so what's happened on the, on the primary seafood side? Well, well, the big things have been, of course, if you're talking uh, the last 15, 20 years has been the rise of aquaculture. Not a significant presence in Nova Scotia, but still a, 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 an important part of the, of, of the industry here. So that's, that's, that's been a significant thing. So what's going on in the primary processing, secondary processing and, and the like, that first receiver thing. So essentially, there's many people on this call who are involved in the primary fishery. So I don't have to tell you about the challenges and changes with quota fisheries. But certainly, you know, the 40% reduction in haddocks, a big deal uh, going into this year. We continue to have quota issues around herring and cold water shrimp. There's certainly a, a resurgence in redfish. We're starting to see that. Um, and the most highly valued species that we, that we sell uh, as, a, as a province are, are lobster and crab. And those biomasses are strong. So, so those are, that's a big thumbnail overview of, 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 the, of the primary side. What about in the, 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 the processing side? Well, there's been some pretty significant ownership changes. Again, Clearwater, uh, a recent sale, um, the recent purchase of Fisherman's by uh, Mersey. There's certainly some changes to industry structure. There's been some changes uh, in capital investment on the, on the primary side as well. So you've got some investment in primary processing with Mersey and also with Scotia Harvest, um, and, but not a lot on the secondary side. But what, one of the things that everybody in this, in this segment of the market is dealing with, and I, I've got them highlighted here, is, is um, global food safety requirements. And there's a big push, and you're gonna, I'm sure in anything that Mersey's done and Scotia Harvest is doing, they're looking at GFSI certification. So this demand, for our processors to meet uh, global food safety is a is a big uh, a, a, a big requirement for companies, and it's a big cost for companies to play to sell to the the retailers uh, uh, in North America and around the world. So that's a big big thing that's happened in this sector. With regards to uh, other components of this, there still is a significant um, a component of the industry and a role played by what I'm calling a seafood supplier. And a seafood supplier generally doesn't own quota. So a good example in um, Nova Scotia would be a uh, company that's based here like Fisher King that, that you know, is selling product on behalf of, I think uh, over a hundred uh, crab plants and, and, and 50 or 60 odd uh, lobster suppliers. So those, those, those links in the chain are very vital. And, they're, and, they're, and they haven't changed as a result of COVID. You still need a way to get your product to the, to, to the uh, retailers or the food service operators. And those seafood suppliers supply a very vital role. And there's not a lot of people that are, that, are, that are going directly from a primary or secondary role, unless they're vertically integrated to try to go directly to the market. And as well, there also is a role for the broker trader. And the broker trader I define as as a, as a selling company that, that, that doesn't take possession of the product, but usually earns a, a commission or a commission-based structure to compensate them. But again, very vital part of moving product from a very decentralized industry through the marketplace to, to the final consumers. So those, that's a bit of a summary as to what's happened in, the, uh, in this part of the supply chain. And what about, what about the distribution sector? What's been the significant change, changes there, if any, in the last little while? So just for definitional purposes, a broadliner, typically biggest broadliners in North America are Cisco and GFS. 
Gordon Food Service. And a broadliner is somebody who carries a broad line of products. So they carry some seafood and protein and dry goods, and they're huge and dominant. And uh, they're the two largest in North America. And, and their role, of course, has been dramatically changed in the last year because of the decline, uh, temporarily at least, of, of a much of the food service and restaurant sector. The specialty fish distributor has always been there. Seafood is a, is a specialty protein, and th that role is pretty dominant. But what's really interesting relevant to, to retail is that um, many of the specialty fish distributors have lost a little, of their, a little bit of their market power. So for example, uh, a retailer like Loblaws um, is buying as direct as they can now from producers. So, so as a producer, you can sell Loblaws and ship directly into their warehouse in Moncton. Um, and um, so, so, so as a result, some of the traditional role played by the specialty fish distributor of direct store delivery is changing. So that, that's certainly a factor. Uh, Sobe still maintains a specialty fish distributor that's owned by uh, one of our next speakers uh, called AC Covert, and they have that role and, that, and, and they, are, they are providing that distribution role to go to uh, directly to, to, to the Sobe stores with that model. So, and then the final thing I just want to comment on is the specialty distrib distributors. And th there, there, there's been a significant increase in the, in the role of a specialty distributor, not necessarily carrying fish, but carrying proteins. Uh, and and there's, there's some ethnic distributors that have cropped up to service uh, 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 an ethnic uh, restaurant base. So this is, this, there is growth in this category. The question really is, are they, they're not been big in seafood yet. Um, will they become a bigger role? Um, and, and that's the question yet to be determined. Okay. So now what I'd really like to go on to talk about is the critical thing about, about the supermarket sector. What's happened in the supermarket sector recently? What are those dominant trends that may or may not create more opportunity for Nova Scotia seafood? So big thing here. Uh, so, so essentially you've got your traditional grocery chains and what I call mass merchandisers. Mass merchandisers, really the two big, big players in that you might class as a mass merchandiser in Canada are Costco and Walmart. And why are they called mass merchandisers? Because they don't just sell food. Now the traditional grocery chains sell more than just food as well, but these people specialize in a much broader array of products. And if we look at what's happened in Canadian retail, if you take the three dominant traditional grocery chains being Lobla, Sobe, and Metro, and you put in Costco and Walmart, those five are, depending on who you talk to and what the source of data is, at least, as, at, least at 70% of the total um, uh, market share for food in Canada. So that's a big, that's a big share. So you only got five to deal with. And, and within that, um, the biggest growth in the last five years has been the share that's been taken by Costco and Walmart. And, it, and just as a, a point of illustrating some numbers, so there's 102 Costco's in Canada. Their sales in 2020 were 22 billion. There's 1,500 uh, Sobe stores in Canada among all their banners. Their sales in 2020 were 25, I think 25 or 26 billion. So here you have a, a, a single retailer with 102 stores that's doing total sales that's not that far off of what the entire Sobe chain does. Now, Costco sales aren't all food, but still it just shows you the, 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 the power and the size those Sobeys warehouses have in food retailing. And I think that's a very, very significant trend in Canada. And um, I, I still think you're gonna see some growth in share from that, from that operation. And, um, and I know you may not think they're big in food, but I know in the, in, in the category that I used to be involved in, smoked salmon, I would, uh, and it'd be interested to see if Devin agrees with me, I would argue that, uh, Costco has the single biggest skew in smoked salmon in Canada. In other words, they sell more smoked salmon 
uh, in one SKU than any other SKU in, in, in Canada by any other retailer. That's pretty significant uh, among 102 outlets. So um, that's sort of uh, my take on that sector. The other thing I think is I want to point out is specialty food stores. And, and, and there's been a tremendous growth in that area. Not so much affected, I, I don't believe has had much of an impact on um, seafood, but it's certainly a, a growth that we've seen more and more of. And, and in fact, if you look at, uh, look at grocery statistics, the specialty food segment has the, been the fastest growing segment in terms of, of, of total sales. They don't have a big share, but, they're, but their growth has been more than anywhere else. And, and all you have to do is look around and, and, and see the number of ethnic food stores that are out there. Here's an example, uh, I think I have it here, of one that's just here in HRM. And this is the free range store. So this is a, an interesting example of a, of a store that's owned by a, uh, uh, a, a chicken processor and they've integrated forward. They have their own, their own outlet now. They do sell a bit of seafood. But this this is a phenomena that you you uh, you're seeing more and more of, and the and the and the rise of this of the specialty store is a big deal. So the question really becomes, how uh, is there an opportunity here for seafood? And 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 there may be. I think there's probably they, this free range store does sell some frozen seafood, so there may be a, a way to service the segment. So then the question becomes, how do you get to it? And here's one. That's an interesting opportunity. Uh, that's they're not selling any seafood yet, but they certainly sell more than potato chips. Sorry, went back. So, so, so I actually have a couple of clients now that I've put into and uh, organized arrangements with Cupboard Bridge to distribute to this independent food segment, and and they have uh, about eleven trucks. And they service over 1,100 outlets in in uh, in the Maritimes, so they're getting to outlets and retail outlets that are are not being served by other distributors as well, and and um, they represent an opportunity. And I guess the point of the matter is it's not may not be totally relevant for for seafood at this point in time, but I think the point is that as a producer or processor, you always have to be thinking about that distribution question. How am I going to get my product to my end market? So finally, I want to talk about the consumer piece of this thing. So what's been going on with consumers' attitudes and behavior uh, post and, and both last year and now, what do I think is going to happen post COVID? So just before we do that, I'm going to do one more poll. It'll be the final poll of the day and here it is. I'm gonna relaunch it because I screwed it up the first time. Is that poll working? No, it's not working, is it? Oh, there we go. Okay, so the question on the table is what percentage of food sales um, do we think were done via the online route in 2020 via uh, a, a retailer like Loblaw? So we know they've gone up everybody's commented on, on, on uh, the use of online ordering for pretty well everything and foods and foods there. So, so here's the question, what percentage do we think, uh, um, and I've got the actual results for Loblo actually for 2020, so I'm gonna share those in a second. So it looks like in this case, I'm going to, let me think here. I'll end the poll, I'll share the results. So there you can see it. Most people are of the belief that it's between five and 20. Over half think it's between five and 20. Actually, uh, uh, almost 30% think it's greater than 20. Well, here's the only poll that you might not have got right. So I'm gonna share this. I'm just gonna go to the next screen here. Okay. So what's the answer? The answer is in 2020, Loblaws did $2 billion in online food sales and their, and their total sales in 2020 were 51 billion. So less than 5%. So it's a really interesting phenomenon because, 
and I've actually uh, had some uh, polite disagreements with some other people that are in the retail game who think it's much higher than that. And it, it, it may be, there may be some, some things that are being missed, but in terms of, I, I would have thought that Loblaw sales would have been higher uh, online than they are now. And I think it's, it's a very tough, it's a very tough category. It's, a, they, they, it's an extremely expensive way to, to fulfill um, orders um, for food online. There's so much, you know, there's so many people that are concerned about whether uh, they're gonna be comfortable with people picking their produce at the store. So I think it's going to be continuing to be a challenge to, to grow that. And, and, and the fascinating thing is when you look at an economy like the UK, you know, their, their levels of sales to, to buy online are 25 to 30%. So it's quite a bit higher. So, so that's the answer to the question about how much uh, online selling is there. Um, so let's ask ourselves a few things or let's look at a few things about what kinds of attitudes and behavior are, are we expecting to see post COVID 2021. So some of the stuff I'm going over is things we've already covered, but it's worth repeating them. So what's so frozen is back big time all categories. And that's a really encouraging thing for seafood um, that people are, are, are more and more people are more comfortable with eating frozen format. So that's that's a that's back big time. And I think that'll continue to be a, a factor going forward. Buy Canada, buy local. These are trends that were already around. They were accelerated during COVID. And, and, and I'll leave it to Devin to have, she's got some really interesting consumer data on that. But that's a big deal. And, and I think that's, that's quite relevant. You know, Perennia, along with the ministry, are pursuing a, a Nova Scotia seafood branding project. And, and uh, you can see some examples in the background there. That's a, a product with the Nova Scotia seafood brand that's being sold at Costco. It's, uh, it's an oyster product from Nova Scotia. And you can see product in Nova Scotia prominently displayed there. So that, that type of signage, that type of labeling, uh, cons retailers are giving their consumers what they're looking for. So that's again, very promising for our, for, for our industry. Uh, third thing, I, I, I coined this expression, green and clean will win. And what I mean by green and clean is, is uh, the, the demand for more sustainable packaging um, is, is, is a big deal. And, and anything, and sustainability is a big deal. So, so that demand for having a packaging that's recyclable or compostable, it's going to continue to, to be a big factor. And the clean element of this is, is what I'm referring to our ingredient declarations. So free from is a big, big deal and it's gonna be continuing to become important. Uh, uh, consumers don't want, um, uh, if, they're, if they're buying aquaculture, you see antibiotic free, uh, salmon being trumpeted a lot in the marketplace and they don't want um, any chemical additives in their seafood. So clean ingredient decks, are a big deal and they're gonna be, become more important. Uh, extended shelf life, that the extended shelf life fresh, I'd be interested to see what Devin has to say about that, but that's been a phenomenon, certainly in the salmon world where you're starting to see backpack, fresh backpack product that has extended shelf life and uh, has meets oxygen transmission rates. So that, that's, that extended shelf life fresh, I think is gonna become a feature uh, going forward, and I think consumers are going to embrace it. And then finally, just to refer to that point about direct to consumer selling, I still think it's going to be a challenge. I still think it's going to be hard for us to grow that share in, in, in Canada. So finally, final slide, look like I'm pretty good on time. Um, so Amidst all that, what does this mean? What are the implications of this for, for, for Nova Scotia and our, and our ability to grow sales? So I just wanted to kind of quickly summarize some of the main, 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 main both opportunities and challenges that I think uh, the Nova Scotia and the Atlantic Canadian industry uh, faces. So first off, our primary raw material, we, we, we often face really stiff global competition in all the markets that we're in from other countries in the world that are producing fish. And, and uh, the example that I, I like to use, even in our home market, I call it CFA haddock, which means come from away haddock. And so another poll I was thinking about running was 
um, asking everybody what percentage of haddock that they're that sold at restaurants in Nova Scotia is actually from Nova Scotia. And I've talked to a couple of distributors about this. And um, the, the, the story that I'm getting is, and I think it's true, is 70 to 80% of the haddock that, that is being served in restaurants in Nova Scotia is actually coming from uh, elsewhere. And it's coming because it's, it's, it's been either, it's been caught in the Barents Sea uh, and it's been frozen at sea. It's been either processed in China and it's come in through one of those broadline distributors as a haddock supply, uh, or, or secondly, it's coming in from some of our local retail specialty fish distributors who have a very viable source of year round product at a consistent price and consistent quality. And, and they're able to offer that into the marketplace. So that's a reality. Um, and, and, and is there a tremendous opportunity for Canadian haddock? I think there is, um, but we have to face the reality that there's lots of whitefish supply coming in here from other places that we're gonna to have to compete against. So we have some stiff competition. Uh, second thing about high risk purchases, seafood is still considered a high risk purchase. Uh, many consumers uh, are, are concerned about the costs of, of seafood relative to other proteins the convenience of seafood, and they don't have a high degree of cooking comfort. Now, it's interesting to think that potentially in this past year, there's been some increasing comfort that's been gained uh, by consumers. And, and so let's all hope that, um, that that cooking comfort will continue going forward. But no question that it's, it's con still considered to be a high-risk purchase. Sec third thing, consumers, seafood consumers are, I, I use the term, notoriously conservative. If you look at the consumption trends of the major species, they, with the exception of the past year, where it looks like crab might have overtaken shrimp, where our seafood purchases are relatively confined to a, a relatively few number of species. So it, 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 it means that um, it, it, it's challenging to introduce new products uh, because it's tough to get trial. And, 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 and Doug Park can speak to that. I'm sure, I don't know if he will, but he'll tell you some stories about some products that they've tried. They've got some very successful ones, but they've also had some that have been very difficult to get consumers to, 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 that, to, to resonate with consumers to try it. Um, so fourth point is, whoops. Fourth point is our, our, our seafood raw materials are expensive for value adding. And you know, I, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, our big biomasses, our big fisheries are shellfish species. So you've got scallops and you've got, you've got uh, uh, crab um, and you've got lobster. Those are all expensive raw material. So, so once you try to value add those and, a com and, a com and, and sort of provide for the yield changes that, that are gonna occur, um, it just becomes very expensive. So they're expensive to value add, and that's just a reality. It means that we have to get very creative as to the type of things that we, we do go after. Um, an example of, of sort of the, uh, the, the, the question of retail price points that come of, uh, as a result of that, they are high as well. So here's an example of a product um, that came out in 2019. This was offered by... Um, by Aquastar out of the West Coast that was taking advantage of a very popular trend in food kits. And so they came up with some seafood uh, uh, kits to, to, to the marketplace in 2019. You can see all the, the you know, the, the, there they've got sustainable recyclable packaging in here. They've got, uh, they provided a full meal deal. And so this product, uh, I think the suggested retail was $12.99 or $13.99 US. And it was to serve two people, and it, and it was a good-looking, good-looking pack, good-looking product, consistent with the trend that was out there in the retail sector. Um, it wasn't successful. It didn't resonate with the consumers. You can't find that product now in the marketplace. So those are some of the challenges with value added that you're going to run into. So um, uh, it's Lynn. We're going to give yeah, you one minute. One, one minute. minute. Perfect. I'm just about done. Uh, so finally, um, I guess my, my point on this is that um, to get into this game requires uh, investment um, to get into retail friendly value added formats. And it also requires collaborations because it's difficult for a single producer, a single processor to take a product to market. So 
they need to seek out some of those other partners that I that I showed in the distribution channel to 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 get to that uh, to get to that uh, segment that they, they that product might sell in. So I, I I think that's important, and I think finally the 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 key to all of this, and 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 hopefully I, I I've set the table a bit for for the speakers to follow because I think the key to all of that is that you have to organize and plan and execute a go-to-market product and distribution strategy. And that's the key. And, and, and I know in the examples to come um, from Devin and Doug and Patrick with his uh, the Buy Local initiative, you'll hear some examples of some case studies of people who have been successful at doing that. So with that, um, I'd like to say thank you very much. Thanks for your time. And um, I look forward to any questions that people may have and I'll mute myself now and listen to the other speakers. And Al, if you can unshare your screen, yep. it'll be on. Awesome. Well. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Al. Um, our next speaker is Devin Zanata, who is the Senior Marketing Manager at True North Seafoods. Devin has five years of seafood and marketing experience, primarily focused on retail within North America. She has helped many bring products and campaigns to market in Canada and the US driven by multiple species specific opportunities, in, including salmon and shrimp. Working closely with the True North sales team and retailers in North America, Devin is well versed in what retailers and consumers are looking for in the seafood category, leading to products and campaigns that fit market needs. So please join me in welcoming Devin. Thanks so much, Lynn. So um, for discussion today, uh, you know, Al kind of said, you know, I'll be mimicking actually a lot of what he found in terms of, uh, you know, impact of COVID-19 on North American grocery retail, as well as I want to talk about some trends that we see for seafood and then um, just going to give you some insights on you know, how we as a company, Turner Seafood, have responded to these changes in the marketplace. And uh, there's some key learnings that we're finding with retailers in terms of what to expect into 2021. Um, you know, more, more so in Canada, grocery retail is starting to behave uh, business as usual in terms of how they're bringing in new products. Whereas in the US, we're seeing that they are, uh, it's not quite back to where they were. So first things first, um, very similar to what Al had shown, you know, and I'm sure that we all have personal experience in how our personal eating habits have changed, but, uh, you know, 80% of Americans said that their uh, eating behaviors have changed due to COVID. Um, with the shutdown, with people being uh, not comfortable eating out. And uh, from an industry perspective, producers who were, uh, who were ready to fill the surge in retail demand definitely fared better than those who, uh, who were less prepared. Um, retail in 2020, in terms of the three main categories, we saw significant growth in frozen followed closely by fresh. Um, so this is not to say that fresh is not important, um, but frozen definitely uh, saw the most growth uh, or benefited best from the organic growth with more people doing, uh, going into grocery. In terms of top seafood sales, um, this is data of uh, uh, seafood sales at retail. So salmon is still the powerhouse in terms of species, but you see things like crab. Num crab was the number one species in sales growth. And I think that that's driven by a few trends. Um, you know, going back to the impact of the pandemic, I think you see a lot more people that are willing to try different products, food products that they wouldn't typically buy, but that they would enjoy eating out at a restaurant. Um, given that people are looking for that little bit of indulgence, I think that that is huge for, you know, seafood as a category and, uh, and helps us overcome some of the barriers to entry that we've had 
leading into DIY is in, which is awesome for our category because the biggest hurdle we've had in this category is encouraging people to actually prepare seafood at home, or at least I know in the last five years, that is definitely the major issue that I've worked to overcome through, you know, seafood school, different recipes, just making uh, seafood more approachable to prepare in home. Uh, and if we can continue as a category to ride this wave and, um, you know, benefit uh, from this trend, I think that we'll be well positioned. Uh, my view on e-commerce is a bit different than Al's. Um, I definitely think that uh, while e-commerce is still a notably small uh, percentage of grocery sales, uh, particularly in Canada, where the U.S. is a bit further ahead than we are, I still think that it's going to be massive opportunity for us. Not only, not just because the transaction isn't being made online doesn't mean that you shouldn't be really trying to get online because we see it all the time. People are going online, looking at grocery stores, even if they are going into stores. So just because your product wasn't sold, we also know that seafood is a destination in the grocery store. What I mean by that is that a consumer is not in the grocery store going, oh, I'm going to pick up salmon. The consumer knows before they go to the grocery store that they're going to pick up salmon. So how can we make sure that we're fitting into um, the consideration set for the consumer to get to purchase, be it online or in store and, uh, vocal for local and sustainable. Um, because people have had time to pause and really assess their purchasing behaviors, uh, due to economic factors and, and what have you, um, people feel very strongly about choosing locally produced and Canadian products. Uh, which I have a slide later on that really demonstrates that. And of course, driv driven by changes in consumer behavior, uh, what we're expecting as a company is that into 2021, retailers are going to have a reprioritization of their SKU sets. And uh, what we anticipate is that there will be uh, portfolio consolidation. So, you know, with these changes in consumer demands and buying patterns, they'll be looking to respond uh, in a way that's going to help their sales, as well as retailers are going to continue to seek more cost-effective uh, supply chain options, just because we saw the, you know, how supply chains were challenged in this last year. So that will be topical for the next year. The other thing is, is that a lot of these sustained, uh, sorry, a lot of these category shifts are anticipated to be sustained for the next 24 plus months. So considering the fact that we're going to be in this, you know, for the next 24 months, how can we best respond as a company? And I uh, have to note this labor is still an ongoing issue. And this is retailer side and vendor side, be it from um, plants, spacing in plants, not being able to push uh, as much volume or having to find a different way to do this. Also, um, at retail, because of the volume that they've had, they're looking at a way of having retail ready products. So how can you produce a product that can just be placed on the shelf that doesn't require any additional, you know, date coding or what have you that allows it to go get on the shelf quicker? Leading into um, growth opportunities that we see in 2021. So we've got seven of these. And again, I think leveraging e-commerce uh, within the existing retail network that you operate in is massive. Um, you know, we always in retail talk about shelf space, but I think that um, with how far along we've come in digital, we need to start talking more about uh, getting that digital space, be it through uh, your retailer or other online uh, sellers. So on this, compared to last year, I am buying groceries more often. Of course, uh, this is just to reiterate the point that um, getting visibility of your products online will be beneficial because people are still, people were buying more online, uh, buying more groceries, sorry. And we expect that to continue into 2021. 
uh, leveraging and growing uh, cross selling and purchasing opportunities. I've always thought that this is huge in seafood uh, just because of course we want to sell more to people that are already in the category, but we also can't lose sight of how do we get people into the category. And there's huge opportunities to do that by partnering with other um, other categories that already have a consumer base that are very similar to ours. So I think of if you're looking at produce, how can you find a way to do cross promotions with an organic asparagus pr producer or what have you to bring people to bring attention to your product and bring people into the seafood section. Um, the other thing I would say on this is that if you can secure a secondary um, merchandising location, I think that that's really important because as we know, um, similar to uh, seafood grocery sales being a small portion of overall grocery, uh, seafood the seafood section sees uh, oftentimes on average less than 10% of all foot traffic. So how can you find other places to bring attention to your product uh, in higher traffic areas? Um, this is this has been big for the last few years, but the pandemic has really ac accelerated uh, the importance of this. I'm going to show some data that I found really interesting. This data is from Canadians. And when you look at how people feel about uh, wanting to eat more healthy, you know, it's not huge, but still 30% of people are looking to eat uh, healthier foods. And as a category, we have a great story to tell in terms of the health benefits of the products in which we sell. And this is actually driven by people eating at home. So it's a massive opportunity as we continue to see these uh, shifts continue for the next 24 months. And, and I was talking, I was about, talking how about how fresh saw the highest growth. And it's really, and it's really important. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, it's frozen growth. Frozen growth. Uh, frozen uh, growth and the opportunities for what is frozen. But let's not forget that, uh, that fresh still has that healthy halo. So, you know, I wouldn't say that frozen is the silver bullet, but we definitely, as a category, need to find ways to play in that segment. And uh, of course, always large in seafood. This will continue into 2021. Transparency and sustainability drives interest and dollars. And again, this was um, this is consumer data from Canadians. And I think that companies that don't operate in a way that offers transparency and compliant business practices could see a redirection of spending from consumers. It's, uh, as you can see, so many uh, points here index over 50%, and uh, it's a huge opportunity in our category. And going into um, supporting meal planning and execution, I mentioned this a little bit in that that's the biggest barrier in seafood is actually getting consumers to prepare seafood at home. So continuing to make seafood easy uh, is going to be critical. Uh, we did a campaign a couple of years ago that actually that was the campaign, seafood is easy. Um, very clear, concise messaging on uh, making the category more approachable to prepare at home will offer great benefit. And uh, shelf life, of course, shelf life has always been important, but now so the other trend that we're seeing is that while grocery spending is up, trips to the store actually are less. So consumers largely were trying to minimize how many trips they made to the grocery store. While I think that that was a bit of an extreme that we saw in 2020, uh, we can expect that to continue into uh, 2021. So consumers want to be able to have, you know, a product in their fridge for a few days versus having to consume it that night. And for us as producers, it's great um, because closer to the source always helps when it comes to shelf life on fresh. 
And finally, uh, 2021 holidays are an opportunity for seafood. And this is not just uh, the holiday season, the traditional holiday season uh, in you know December. I'm looking at all major holidays, Easter, even Canada Day. I think that people are going to be looking to celebrate as, uh, as people are able to now. Um, and they'll be largely doing this at home still into 2021. Uh, just a little bit about our response uh, to some of these trends. Uh, frozen has been a relatively newer category for us. Uh, of course, we've had frozen products in, in the past, but uh, definitely we've been driving more um, frozen first initiatives. And, uh, and our goal in this category is bringing premium products into frozen retail. And, uh, you know, we know that many consumers buy frozen seafood, 75% of them. Uh, so there's a, there's a huge opportunity for seafood in this category. And specifically, I want to talk about a, a, um, a product that we launched uh, this last year. And, you know, it's the perfect example of how we took into account all of these trends into one product to come up with something that consumers are looking for, um, you know, it's a wild caught uh, deep sea red crab product. Uh, so we have uh, an offering in a bag as well as in a tub and it's available at Metro, Atlantic Superstore, Loblaws and Zares. Um, with it being frozen, we can offer a product that has no preservatives or additives, which again is very on trend, similar to what Al was saying with his, you know, green and clean. And it's also processed in Canada. Um, so a lot of other products in this space are not processed in Canada. And while the crab itself is ca caught in Uruguay, we actually bring it in frozen into Canada and process it here, uh, which is widely celebrated. <laughs> and keys for ongoing success uh, from a sales perspective. So I was connecting with our sales team uh, to understand, you know, what they're seeing in the marketplace, because I think it's important to understand it from that perspective. And um, timing of uh, product presentations is more critical uh, than ever. They highlighted the frozen portfolio. I would argue that it's it's just as important on fresh, because uh, as retailers are responding to the market, uh, planning is going to continue to be more and more important. Um, managing RFP calendars for our, all of our retailers so that uh, opportunities are not missed. Just a little bit about uh, frozen activities and how they're planned as well as fresh and uh, continuing to secure product placement. And again, this goes into placement in store and on the digital shelf. And then finally, I want to talk a bit about Product of Canada because I think that this is the single largest opportunity for uh, Canadian producers in the Canadian retail market. Um, Canadian consumers fundamentally want to see Canadian products. Um, with the pandemic, this was already happening a bit before the pandemic, but it has the pandemic has really accelerated uh, the interest in domestic production. So any opportunity that there is uh, to keep production domestically, I think uh, will be widely celebrated. And that's shown by this consumer data. So when you look at, you know, the, the interest in the two claims made in Canada and locally made, I mean, the story tells itself. And that was all I had, but I welcome your questions if you want to enter them through the chat function, as well as I think we might have a minute or two at the end um, of the presentation today, but thank you all for your time. Thank you so, so much, Devin. Uh, we're gonna keep motoring folks. So our next speaker is Patrick Kelly, the Bi-Local Coordinator for the Bi-Local Project at Perennia. Today, Patrick will highlight the Bi-Local Program, get your hands um, on local, and opportunities for retail, seafood, sales, and promotions. So please join me in welcoming Patrick. Hello, everybody. Share this. So yes, I'm going to give a little overview of our program here, just launched actually February of 2020. 
Um, the reason this uh, Get Your Hands on Local came about is, as Al and Devin mentioned, uh, there's a big trend in uh, consumers looking for local products. And so we at the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Aquaculture wanted to help support that trend and make it easy for Nova Scotians to uh, find these products. We started the Get Your Hands on Local program um, to uh, support the fact that Nova Scotians want to buy local. And we partnered with uh, many grocery uh, retail chains as well as independent markets. Um, and on the beverage side, of course, uh, sparkling wine goes with our seafood, Tidal Bay, of course. We partnered with NSLC as well to highlight Nova Scotia beverage products. Um, so yeah, and also a big partner in this program is Taste of Nova Scotia, a widely recognized uh, brand in Nova Scotia for quality and, uh, and um, high standards in food. So we partnered with them to uh, get this program up and running and make sure that we had the right Nova Scotia products uh, identified. So the Get Your Hands on Local program is here to identify Nova Scotia grown uh, and produced products. Um, to help the consumer find it uh, quickly and find what's Nova Scotian in their retail spots. And ultimately through those sales, helping Nova Scotia producers sell more as the demand goes higher. Um, so, will, uh, so will their products sell more. So uh, this initiative will be accomplished by communication through our retail locations, but also supported by campaigns and uh, media um, purchases. So here's a list of a few of the retailers that we have. Now it does look small, but this encompasses over 180 retail locations throughout Nova Scotia that our program is highlighted in. So, uh, so we have some big players in there, but also lots of uh, other small markets jumping on board when they, uh, when they first opened their doors. Arthur's Urban Market, to be example, opened up in 2020 and they were quite happy to join on with our programs. So there's a, quite a few and it's steadily growing too as we get gain more inches from our retailers to highlight their Nova Scotia products. So what you'll see at those retails, um, so we created some uh, point of sale items to uh, help Nova Scotians know that that product's from Nova Scotia. So a few of them are these danglers that hang off of, uh, say we have a, a few containers of um, seafood in jars or the, the dips that come out are seafood dips. We have our danglers on the shelves there for those. Um, freezer stickers for the frozen uh, market. So we have a few frozen fish products, as Devin mentioned. Um, so we have freezer stickers there. And uh, the last on the, on the side there is a brand new uh, one that we brought to market, uh, an ice pick. So uh, we sent those out to our major retailers for every day they set up their ice chest, we, they have uh, an abundance of those ice picks that anything Nova Scotian in that ice chest gets an ice pick in front of it. So when you walk up to the counter, you know that that product's Nova Scotian, which uh, if you looked before, you'd be scratching your chin as to what would be Nova Scotian or what would not. So, uh, so we're very happy to include that in our, in our point of sale materials. And so, as I said, it was a, uh, accompanied by some media campaigns. Um, so throughout 2020, we had four uh, media buys in each season. Um, each one had a, a sample of seafood within the presentation of our campaigns. Um, but then in February of 2021, we actually did a 100% seafood uh, co uh, commercial campaign. So focusing on seafood varieties that are available in Nova Scotia, um, and uh, how easy it is to get your hands on local seafood within Nova Scotia. So we accompany that with television ads you may have seen on the three uh, uh, news networks. So CTV, Global and CBC, we ran our television commercials. Um, we had print ads, not only in the HRM area, but we sent out print ads to the local community papers as we see a, a big um, opportunity in the rural areas to push seafood, uh, not only on the South Shore and in Cape Breton area, but even in the valley here. Um, there's a, a big need for uh, seafood and availability here, so we want to push that it is available. Um, and social media is a big one that we are uh, developing and enhancing more. Um, just recently throughout the holiday season, we felt that seafood needed a boost. As uh, Devin mentioned, it's a prime time to uh, to sell our seafood products. So we worked with a bunch of influencers on the Instagram platform and uh, each one either created a seafood dish from something they purchased at a local retailer or um, ordered online. Uh, one of our influencers ordered a pack of oysters. 
was able to shuck them at home and uh, have a good evening with her significant other um, for New Year's. So it's kind of a, a way to show Nova Scotians that look, you can go out to a restaurant to have your oysters, but you can have just the same quality at home. So that's kind of what we want to have the best of both worlds here in Nova Scotia. And uh, in store as well, here's a few examples of our seafood counters uh, on the uh, one display is uh, the Sobeys in Windsor there that have taken on the program, putting stickers on each of their, their freezer uh, bins there. And then the other ones from Fisherman's Market um, in Bedford that they have uh, have a variety of Nova Scotia seafood that they created a nice display uh, uh, pinpointing all the del delicious uh, species that we have to offer there. So more and more of those ice picks are out throughout the Nova Scotia region and we are uh, growing that program as well. And so uh, another support that we have, um, we created a directory with the partnership of Taste Nova Scotia. It's a Taste Nova Scotia, get your hands on local. So they're not only uh, places where you can find seafood, but where you can find all Nova Scotia um, produced uh, products such as vegetables, beverage, agri-food, as well as our seafood members are, uh, are listed there. Um, a way to be involved in this program, uh, not necessarily a need to be a member of Taste of Nova Scotia, but as I mentioned, in order to uh, ensure some quality assurance and that, we strongly encourage you to look into uh, a membership. It's very easy to uh, start the application process and the team at Taste of Nova Scotia is always there to help with any any needs you may uh, have for quality uh, packaging and, and branding, um, they're always there to help for that, for your help in retail. And then also through the Nova Scotia Department of Agriculture, Aquaculture and Fisheries, we do have buy local programs. Um, the link here shows uh, the ones that just ended in December 31st, 2020. I can assure you that there will be new programs coming out this year to help along with those uh, funding of developing in quality packaging and also marketing abilities of your products. So uh, feel free to visit that site and read about the programs and there should be some new ones rolling out. So thank you very much, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that. And our program is sure to grow this year with the trend of buy local. Thank you so, so much, uh, Patrick. Um, just so folks know, um, Al is uh, typing furiously to answer some of the questions um, on the Q&A screen. And so Patrick, there's one there from you from Eric. So can you perhaps Perfect. while Doug is speaking and answer those and um, we'll keep going. So last but not least, our final speaker is Doug Park. Uh, Doug is the co-owner and founder, owner and co-founder of Cedar Bay Grilling Company, a successful value add salmon company that produces and ships salmon products across North America and into the United Kingdom. Prior to the startup of Cedar Bay, Doug was president and CEO of Tour Eiffel Inc., a specialty meat company located in Quebec. Doug gained his sales and marketing and management skills as a group product manager at McCain's Foods in Florenceville, New Brunswick, and Maple Leaf Foods, Canada. So please join me in welcoming Doug. Thanks, Lynn. Hopefully everybody can uh, hear me okay. Um, so yeah, we started Cedar Bay in uh, 2008. We're uh, a value-add uh, seafood uh, producer. And um, our signature item is our cedar planked uh, salmon, which is uh, produced here uh, in Nova Scotia. It's a frozen product. And our first customer was, in, uh, was right here in Atlantic Canada. It was Sobeys uh, Atlantic. And now, uh, 12 years later, you can find us um, pretty much all the major retailers across Canada, including uh, Loblaws and Sobeys and Metro. Uh, we are found in pretty much every state uh, in the United States. Uh, we ship into uh, Kroger, Publix, um, Safeway and Albertsons on the uh, West Coast, uh, Food Lion, uh, Giant Eagle, Giant Carlisle on the East Coast. Uh, we've done business with Myers. We've done business with Walmart, uh, Sam's Club, and some seasonal business with uh, Costco. Uh, shipped into uh, the UK and as far away as Australia and a little bit into, into South America. So we're no strangers to accessing uh, new retail markets and, and that's what I've been uh, asked to speak on. 
And any region that Cedar Bay has had successful expansion, we've pretty much followed the same approach. And that is to first know the market and then know the chain and then know the distribution for the, uh, the region. And it's a pretty grassroots approach that we, uh, that we take um, because in order to know a market, you need to visit it first. There's nothing beats a, a face to face. And, you know, even within North America, we tend to think of uh, Canada as, as pretty much the same, um, but it's, it's not. I mean, if you look at uh, Quebec specifically, and if you look at there's various different regions across the United States, and we always used to say that there was actually more uh, differences within our countries uh, than between our countries when we're talking about uh, the United States. And so you need to go to the market and you need to see what the consumer uh, sees. In fact, uh, I would spend a lot of my time when we were on vacation visiting grocery stores. My children, I think, thought it was part of a standard vacation to go to grocery stores on vacation. Um, but you need to understand and feel the local flavors. You know, what is the demographic makeup when you're visiting a new market? Is it more urban or rural? And what are the, what are the grocery stores like? Um, do they even have a seafood counter? Um, is it mostly frozen? Is it mostly fresh? Um, and for us, even, you know, more mundane things like, uh, are there bunkers in those stores, which is important to Cedar Bay? And who's the competition? What are the price points? And the best example I can give you is when we expanded into uh, the UK in 2014, uh, our consumer research showed that there was a propensity uh, by the consumer to, to want to buy our cedar planked salmon. Um, but we, after visiting the market, we saw that there was uh, going to be quite a challenge because the UK market and the seafood section was mostly chilled. They had a very well-developed chilled section and a highly underdeveloped frozen section. And the reason for that was that one of the biggest producers of salmon in the world was right across the English Channel and they would deliver into the port and within a day anything can reach almost any uh, region of, of the UK and so um, that helped the development of the, uh, the chilled section and and as I was told when uh, as we were visiting um, the freezer section is for chips and peas, so basically for cheap products. So we knew that we had a challenge and how were we going to address this. The other thing that we learned um, by looking at the market there in, in the UK was their portion size was different than Canadian portion size. Um, Canadian portion size tends to be around five or six ounces, so 140, 150 ounce, or grams. In the UK, it was four ounces or 125 grams. And just as an interesting comparison, uh, in the US, it's double that, it's eight ounces. Uh, so we, we thought that was quite interesting and, and adjusted our um, sizes accordingly. Um, and what ended up happening in order to get to market, um, and it was interesting because we were a little bit ahead of our time, and you have to remember this was back in 2014. So here in North, in North America, that online um, uh, execution, I guess, had only just started here. In the UK, it was quite well developed. And uh, so we ended up uh, going through an online retailer and it was an eye opener for me because they were very well developed and it suited us very well because the uh, consumer was used to having frozen delivered to their home. The, um, they were used to paying a little bit more, they were a bit more affluent, and they were a bit more adventurous, so they were willing to take a chance and try out, you know, this this new uh, product that we were bringing to market. It, it worked out quite well. Um, the other way to get to know a market, of course, is to go to trade shows. And and when I say go to the trade shows, I don't mean to go sell. I mean to go and walk it and see what is happening there and um, who are the other manufacturers that might be in the in the category. And it is also a great place now, alluded to this earlier, to meet brokers and distributors. And my take on brokers um, has always been that they understand the local flavor of the market. They understand, they have the relationship in the market. Um, they have the ear of not only the buyer, but 
you know, other people uh, within the chains and kind of understand what is going on there. And I always viewed us as the expert on the product, but they're the experts on the market and, um, and, and the chains. And, and even now, they've become that much more important um, to, to, um, to, to our communication you know, with the chains because we, of course, cannot visit um, the region now. Um, so it's, it's been an interesting um, um, experience. We've actually increased our, our broker uh, presence throughout the uh, United States. So anyway, once you get a feel for uh, your market, hopefully you're going to get an appointment with, you know, some of the, the chains that uh, are suitable for your product. And so when we go to a chain and we make the presentation, I have two objectives. One is to present our product, of course, and the second is to understand the chain's strategy, and it's so important. And, and so starting with presenting the product, and I know this might seem really mundane, but I've seen a lot of presentations fail because of this, make sure your samples get there. You're probably shipping, if you're going into a new region across the border, your, your samples are going to get stopped. So make sure you send them early. I would typically even try to carry some with me. I would send some to my hotel and I would send some to the chain itself and make sure that they uh, arrive there so that the buyer can actually see what I'm talking about. And the second uh, thing is I keep it to two products or less. I keep it simple and straightforward because buyers see all kinds of products all year long. I show them what I want to sell into the next season. I let them know that, hey, I have a lot of other products and I'll come back and show them to you, but this is what I want to, your, to give your attention to. And once I presented our products, then as I said, I want to understand what chain strategy is. What's your, how do you promote within your, your, uh, your chain? Um, how has that changed? You know, what is your focus for this year? And the best way that I can uh, illustrate that is with a, a recent example that happened three years ago uh, when I was in uh, one of the major chains in the States. And uh, we, we were already in there. We were presenting a different flavor. And they were telling me about how they're changing their program uh, for the beginning of the following year. And they were going to fill the bunkers with items that were $4.99 or less. And we didn't have any of those items. So w when we went back, we talked about it a little bit because we're a barbecue, or our product is on the barbecue. So January and February are, are low months for us. So we reverse engineered a product that could be sold for $4.99. And we presented it, came back and presented it to the buyer. And that was uh, very interesting. Thank you very much. We have the bunkers full, but thanks for showing it to us. We got a call about four months later, I think it was in October, and said, hey, do you still have that product? Because the other product uh, has not come through. And now we went into the bunker in January and February. And every year since then, January and February have been our, one of our bu busiest months. So it does pay not only for yourself, but for the retailer to pay attention. And that's one of the reasons the retailers love to see Cedar Bay is we always come out with some new products and we try to make them fit the strategy of the chain um, or, uh, or the market. Um, the other thing that uh, I'd like to mention is that, as I said, once you know your chain and the market, now the easy part's done. The hard part is to understand that distribution and make sure you get your product to market. And you need to understand the local laws, customs, and requirements. And your first tripping point is actually getting across the border. Because as I mentioned, uh, you're most likely going to be stopped by the um, food inspection agency uh, of the country that you're, you're going into. And your first pitfall is going to be on your label. And so one of the tricks that, that, that we follow is we'll go to the market and we'll find products that may be already existing on the shelf with a big brand or a private label because they follow the labeling laws very closely. And we use that as a template. So as we're researching what is actually required, we use that as a template. We'll get you 99% of the way there. Um, the other thing we do is we always engage a customs broker. You're going to have difficulty at the border um, in just even supplying the correct paperwork. They're going to help you navigate your way uh, through that because inevitably there'll be some odd ball requirement 
uh, that you're going to need and it's going to hold you up. And the third thing that we do is we put small shipments through first, like our samples, so that when it does get stopped, it's a small amount. You don't have a lot of money tied up and you can fix your mistake in the event that that product doesn't actually get across the border. And then, of course, once you have kind of sorted all that through, and Al alluded to this earlier, so I'm not going to dwell on it, is you need to understand the best way to get your product to the market. You're most likely going to ship your product into the first point of distribution, and that may be either directly with the chain, they may be using a third-party uh, warehouse, and so you have to engage with that third-party warehouse and get set up. They may have multiple locations, or they may use a distributor. And quite frankly, one of the easiest ways that we've found when you're going into a new market is to engage a distributor. They know um, how the chains work. They know how the locals work. And it's more expensive, but in the long run, it'll, it'll end up paying off. So anyway, that's uh, we were a little pushed for time, so I tried to speed it up just a little bit uh, for Lynn. Um, but that was our go-to approach. Uh, when we were accessing new markets for uh, Cedar Bay, and I hope it helps you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Doug. Um, we have had some questions all come through um, all during the presentations, and our panelists have been answering them. So since we are at the end of our session, and I, I want to be very cognizant of the fact that people have other things to do today, we're going to pivot a little bit and we are going to do this. So we will email the questions and answers to all participants with the panelists' contact information. If you have another question, please feel free to send it through to info at perennia.ca or any of the contact, the panelists' contact information. Um, we will also do the presentations and have them up by the end of next week on prenia.ca and a recording of this session will also be on prenia's YouTube channel. So I'm so sorry that we don't have time to, to take any more questions, but we will make sure we get you the answers. Um, and I do really thank the folks that uh, took the time to, to put some questions in the uh, Q&A box and to this panelist for answering them uh, furiously as we were typing. So thank you so much to the minister and the Aquaculture Association of Nova Scotia for presenting the series. Thank you to our series sponsors, Farm Credit Canada and the Nova Scotia Fisheries and Aquaculture Loan Board and our session sponsors, um, Alliance Rubber Company and Cook Aquaculture. Thank you so, so much to the participants and, and most of all to our panelists for today. It was, it was awesome information and I'm glad that we'll be able to capture it through your presentations and through the recorded session. And please don't forget the next session, Advances in Shore-Based Seafood Industry Technology. March 25th, noon to 2 p.m. And thank you, everyone, and take care and, and have a really great rest of the day. Bye, everybody. Thanks.